Uh, we're excited that you're here today. We're excited Vicente Cedarberg has launched an environmental health and safety practice group of which I, Michelle Bodium, one of the co-chairs, my colleague Mark Ross as well. We are heading this up, all these efforts, all the great laws are about to talk today as well as with our colleague Heather Coomer. Uh, we'll all be getting into some details about who we are, but just briefly, today's more or less a 101 introduction to environmental laws as applicable to the cannabis industry, cannabis meaning both hemp and marijuana, one plant there. So, you know, some nuances, what's allowed, what's not allowed, depending what side of the plant you're touching. Um, but in general, that's what we're going to be covering today. And there's so much in here that we're really just doing 101, as I said, overview, and then following up, and we'll talk a little bit about this at the end. We've got so much more content to come, webinars, articles, education opportunities. Um, you know, we really hope to dive into each aspect of environmental law in a lot more detail. But today, going to just cover the basics, the big overview, all the alphabet soup and acronyms you're going to need to know to equip yourself um, operating in this space. So just going to hand it over to my colleague, Mark. We're each going to introduce ourselves very quickly, and then we're going to dive deep today. We're not going to open up the floor for questions just because there's so much to cover, and we know there'll be a million questions, but please feel free to reach out to any of us at the end, or if you're comfortable, put your questions and contact information in the chat, and we'll follow up shortly. And then this weather webinar will be a recorded version sent to your inboxes uh, shortly after. That's us. <laughs> Here you go, Mark. <laughs> your turn. <laughs> uh, thanks, Michelle. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about environmental law or learning about the cannabis industry if you already practice environmental law. Uh, my name is Mark Ross. I am the head of impact in ESG at Vicente Cedarberg. I've been an environmental attorney for nearly 30 years in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Uh, most notably, I was the worldwide in-house uh, water and re remediation attorney for Alcoa. I'm a former environmental litigator for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. I was with Reed Smith for a while. Um, been in the cannabis industry for a number of years now, generally in the area of environmental, social, and governance, uh, corporate social responsibility, strategic philanthropy, community engagement. Um, you can see my, <laughs> my receipts there. Um, and I will pass it over to Michelle. Oh, me again. Hi. Um, similar to Mark and going to be similar to Heather, both private and public sector experience, you know, more than a decade practicing environmental law in various roles, primarily in Massachusetts and Connecticut, um, you know, undergraduate law school certificates, all environmental studies, environmental science, environmental law. So, you know, the word environment all around all stages and licensed to practice in New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts. And I'm a senior associate with obviously with the firm and I sit out of our Boston and sometimes our New York office. Hand it over to you, Heather. Hi, I'm Heather Coomer. Uh, it's so great to have you guys here. Uh, I've been in the public and private sector for over over 10 years now, uh, worked in primarily in Jersey City for a while. Uh, for about six years, I was the sustainability coordinator for the Jersey City Redevelopment Agency, handled all those Hurricane Sandy grants and all the sustainability renewal projects, even built a 19 and a half acre park there and a former brownfield site and also a former conflict council for the Princeton Planning Board. Uh, I am uh, barred in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, and my, I'm also a lead AP, so my spe uh, specialty is sustainability. Okay, and I'll hand it back to you guys. Thanks, Heather. So, um, Environmental Law 101 has to start here. Uh, this is a photo of the Cuyahoga River in 1969. It was a flashpoint, no, no pun intended, for the entire environmental movement. And uh, it made people sit up and take notice that things were not great uh, with regard to how we were treating the environment and what we were doing to our natural resources, how we were impacting communities, human health. Um, and, uh, and that's led to a whole bunch of action at the federal level. So this is just a sampling of some of the US uh, environmental laws. Um, the biggies that apply to the cannabis industry, in particular, the light blue, or the light blue um, acts. So the Clean Air Act, 1963, and of course it was amended subsequent times, most recently in 1990. The Solid Waste Disposal Act, um, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, OSHA, 
uh, which applies to all operators, of course. Uh, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1972, otherwise known or soon to be known as the Clean Water Act. Um, you also have the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, RECRA, and we're going to cover a lot of these. Uh, we're going to go a mile wide and an inch deep uh, with the idea of we are going to have subsequent webinars and articles and other opportunities to go deeper on how these acts impact the cannabis industry. Uh, the Clean Water Act, of course, in 1977, uh, which came out of that Federal Water Pollution Control Act, and then CERCLA, the, uh, which also known as the Superfund Act of 1980. Uh, all of these could impact you as an operator, uh, and so we're going to start to touch on them and talk, talk about how they, they could. Um, next slide. All right. So the other thing you need to know about environmental law is that while those acts passed at the federal level, they also allowed for states to create their own environmental laws. Um, the, the federal acts act as a, as a floor. So states can have their own environmental acts um, that can be more stringent than the federal level. And what happens is a state applies, they develop their own environmental act and their own regime and their own regulations, say under the Clean Water Act. Uh, and assuming that it's as stringent as the federal act, they can apply for what is known as primacy. Primacy means first and foremost, the licensing, permitting, enforcement all happens at the state level. And the state then is in control. Uh, of those particular environmental regulations. The other thing though you need to keep in mind is just because a state has primacy over the operators within the state and those laws and the interpretation of those laws doesn't necessarily mean that the feds are on the sidelines. Uh, if the feds don't like how a state is enforcing or not enforcing their laws and regulations, uh, they can always come in and what's called overfile. And I've seen it happen before where uh, operators have been in negotiations with the state to have, say, a consent order around violations of the Clean Water Act. And for whatever reason, the feds come in and overfile. And the last thing you want to be is you want to be on site when the guns and badges show up from the EPA and the FBI um, when they come in and, and try to make a point with regard to a particular operation. So you're not 100 percent out of the out of the woods if you are talking to the state about these things, um, but you just need to be aware of that. Next, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle to talk a little bit about OSHA. So we're gonna be popping on and popping off so you don't have to stare at all of us during this webinar. Um, so, you know, OSHA, as it's known, Occupational Safety Health Administration Act, you know, everything has an acronym most commonly used here is OSHA. And in general, this talks about the health and safety of people, meaning your employees. And just want to drill down a little bit here on the general duty clause. You know, this is the hook that'll get the most number of operators in trouble. And it's the most broad that really the government could have come up with about what's the responsibility that you have as a facility and a music facility. Very broadly, you know, this covers all steps of the supply chain, cultivation, manufacturing, processing, retail. So any sort of facility would be subject to OSHA. And this general duty clause translates to say employers have a general duty to make sure they provide their employees with an area free from a recognized hazard or something that's likely to cause a death. So obviously very broad there, what's your obligations? First step, identifying and controlling any sort of hazard that comes in the form of you know management and planning, um, you know, getting your employees to buy into and acknowledge what are potential hazards, health and safety training, doing some, you know, work site analysis or hazardous prevention and control. There's also a lot of record keeping that comes with all of this to make sure you're properly equipping your employees with the knowledge and that you're doing your part as the employer to keep them safe. There's also a whole host of other things that fold in here. Um, that probably would not be applicable, um, you know, such as temporary labor camps or something like that. Although on the hemp side and cultivation, if you are kind of building temporary labor camps, that could apply to you. And then there's also, um, you know, 29 CFR 1910, which are OSHA standards for general industry that do also apply to manufacturing sections. So that was a lot, but doesn't really give you any concrete examples. So just wanted to give some specific to really 
drill this home. On the OSHA side of things, you as an employer have an obligation to control hazardous energy. You know, what does hazardous energy mean? Something with stored energy, a battery, a motor, you know, and your obligations as the employer to make sure your employee can confirm that that motor you know, is off before they do any work on it and that no one else can come by and turn it on and therefore cause that hazard situation. So, you know, an electric generator, even an air conditioner, you got to have that duty to make sure that power is off and no one can come by and say, oh, something shiny, let me flip that switch, which would then obviously cause, you know, injury or death to an employee potentially. Um, another area, hazardous communications, it's OSHA terminology. That means if you store chemicals or allow your employees to use chemicals, you need to communicate the safety hazards of those chemicals to your employees with signage and labeling um, material safety data sheets and really just make it clear, hey, watch out, this could hurt you, this is a hazard. Then, you know, something very timely, you know, personal protective equipment, PPE, that's always been an OSHA, it's always a requirement to make sure you keep your employees in the equipment they need to be safe. Um, you know, even now more than ever with COVID and what is the scope of PPE, but you know, you have to keep records and make sure everyone's trained on the selection of the PPE, record keeping to know you have it, you're cleaning it, you're sanitizing it for any PPE that's reusable. Um, so in general, as an employer, obligation, responsibility, keep employees safe. And, you know, really within OSHA drills down on how you can do that, um, you know, of all the various aspects that come along with that. And OSHA does have some enforcement mechanisms. For the most part, they're limited to civil penalties, meaning fines. No one's walking in to your facility, you know, and walking anyone out in handcuffs, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Environmental law does come with some criminal penalties on the OSHA side of things. Right now, you know, it's civil penalties, and, you know, there is the obligation to keep your employees safe. All right, thanks, Michelle. All right, Clean Water Act. Uh, so there's two primary areas of the Clean Water Act, and when we talk about um, a lot of these federal statutes, again, Many states have their own statutes and regulations that parrot either the federal uh, statute and regulations or they are more stringent than them, again. But for purposes of this uh, webinar, we're just going to talk about the federal acts. You should know that your state may or, or may not have more stringent regulations. So the two main sections of the Clean Water Act I'd like to cover are Section 402 and Section 404. Section um, 402 deals with discharges, uh, and there's... Basically, it's a discharge of a pollutant from a point source uh, to the waters of the United States. If you are discharging to a water of the United States, river, stream, uh, there's a lot of litigation about what is a water of the United States. It changes politically, it seems, when there is a, a change in administration. But generally, let's just say you're discharging to a stream, a flowing stream, uh, you need to have a permit. Um, either from the state or, or from the feds, uh, a Clean Water Act permit to do that discharge. Uh, so if you have a cultivation inside and you're discharging directly to a stream, uh, you need to identify that, that need. Um, similarly, if you are, let's just say you're in an urban area and you are discharging to your publicly owned treatment works, your POTW, you will also need a permit if you are discharging pollutants to that publicly owned treatment works. There are um, some permits known as general permits that cover certain industries um, that may have a generalized the, uh, similar discharges. Um, it, it really depends on uh, where you are and what you're discharging, but generally you're going to need some kind of pre-treatment permit. So let's just say you've got an indoor cultivation in Denver, Colorado, and you are discharging to the Denver publicly owned treatment works uh, because every time you flip one of your cultivation rooms, you're washing a bunch of chemicals and cleaning solvents and uh, other nutrients down the drain. You need to get a pre-treatment permit. Um, most cannabis companies I'd be willing to bet don't have pre-treatment permits or don't have Clean Water Act permits. Um, the reason why you need these permits is because the violations of the Clean Water Act are quite stringent. Generally, uh, the, the penalty for not having a permit uh, is $50,000 per, up to $50,000 per day. 
and up to three years in jail. Now, it could be more if you are intentionally putting people in harm's way, people's um, uh, likely to cause imminent uh, injury, a serious injury or death. Uh, and it can be less if it is negligent. Of course, as we as lawyers always say, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Uh, but in the middle there and where regulators usually start is the up to $50,000 per day for each violation and up to three years in jail. So significant penalties. Um, again, direct discharges, wastewater, indirect discharges to a POTW, pretreatment permits, and then there are generally uh, general permits with regard to stormwater discharges. Uh, the other area of the Clean Water Act, uh, Section 404, uh, is, uh, applies to wetlands. It's uh, generally under the domain of the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, you don't really need to worry about this so much unless you are impacting a wetland. So construction activities, you're building a new cultivation facility, a new manufacturing facility, um, standalone retail facility in a wetland. Um, all of those could require uh, a Clean Water Act Section 404 permit. Let's see what's next. Safe Drinking Water Act. So the Safe Drinking Water Act generally applies to providers of water, of drinking water. Makes sense, Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, it's basically national health standards for our drinking water across the country. So usually it's public providers of drinking water need to comply with the Safe Drinking Water Act. There are, however, two parts of the Safe Drinking Water Act that could apply to a cannabis company. One is if you have an injection well. So if you have a manufacturing facility and you're getting rid of your waste by injecting it into the ground, that's covered under the Safe Drinking Water Act. The other area that could apply to you is if um, you have a certain number of employees on site and you have well water. So if you are providing a certain number of employees with drinking water, you could be subject to, you could be found to be a uh, basically a public provider of drinking water and you may need a license or a permit under the Safe Drinking Water Act and have to comply with the conditions of that, of that act as well. It varies from state to state. Some states it's 25 employees, some states it's 50. I believe even some states it's 100. Um, so you would need to check with your state to see when you, if you're on well water, if you need to have a Safe Drinking Water Act um, permit. And Clean Air Act, I believe that is Michelle back again. Yeah, so we're breaking it, obviously, you can tell down by, um, you know, elements here, little Captain Planet for you, of air, wind, fire, uh, when our powers combine, we'll make sure the cannabis industry is prepared for all things and compliant with the environmental laws as required. So you're going to hear from me for a couple slides as well, coming up first, Clean Air Act, uh, you know, title pretty self-explanatory. So comprehensive federal regulation regulates air, specifically admissions from any sort of stationary or mobile source. Fun fact, last year, Clean Air Act celebrated its 20th year in business. So 20 years of, under this name, protecting air. And, you know, before that, less protective, <laughs> different names of what people are trying to do, state and federal to protect the air, but at least came up on their 20th anniversary. In general, at the fe federal level, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, sets the limits for certain air pollutant pollutants, uh, as well as setting the limits on how much um, of those pollutants can be in the air across the U.S. at any one time. EPA also has authority to listen limit emissions um, from certain specific sources like chemical plants, utility, or steel mills. Right now, uh, federally, there's no cannabis specific limitations. Um, so right now, like most things in cannabis, it's dropping down to the state level. And as Mark had said previously, individual states or tribes can have stronger pollution laws or really most of these laws. Uh, they just can't have any weaker uh, pollution limits than those set by EPA. So I'm sure most of you are wondering what air pollutants may be admitted by the cannabis industry. So the main one here, volatile organic compounds, VOCs. These can be admitted during the cultivation and processing of cannabis. Um, you know, also these emissions could naturally occur just during the plant growth. Um, and then the majority during the manufacturing and processing stage due to evaporation of solvents or other chemicals that are used to extract out all those good things from the cannabis plants. Um, and then, you know, 
With those admissions also come odor control technologies that are being implemented or required in a number of states. And so, you know, talking about Clean Air Act also talks about permitting and discharge as well as odor. So just flagging a few issues today for you to chew on, and then we'll get into a lot more detail in the future. But most stationary sources of air pollutants are required to obtain a permit before installation. So thinking through what equipment you're going to need and whether or not you would need a permit for that. In addition, if you're generating more than a certain number um, of pollutants in a year, that can also require a permit. These kind of go hand in hand before you install, but then once it's installed, also making sure you have a permit for the life of the equipment. And then certain types of power generating units, um, you know, if you're required in your state to have a backup generator, for example, if power goes out, you're not required to, but you bring on a diesel generator to keep the lights on, um, you know, the literal, literal lights to help you grow in this case, um, you know, those types of emergency or backup generators could also require a permit because of the potential for air admittance, as well as if you use heat or solvents during the processing operation. Then talking about clean air, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for most cannabis operators is odor and odor control. And with this, you know, nuisance related to cannabis odors, you know, a lot of people alleging, um, you know, odor nuisance with interfering the smell of cannabis with their use and enjoyment of the property. Um, and there are some rights to take enforcement. And usually that's typically, you know, your neighbor complaining about an odor crossing onto their their law and their smell, and then you know the state has the authority to come on under the Clean Air Act to enforce. So that is air. And then moving on to waste, uh, which I don't believe was a typical Captain Planet little hero there, but uh, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. This is the public law that creates the framework for proper management of hazard and non-hazardous waste. Within that, just thinking about this solid waste, you know, what is solid? It also actually isn't what we think of all the time as physical solid. It also includes gases and liquids and traditional solids that must be discarded for waste. Uh, EPA has the authority to control hazards. You know, the phrase you might be familiar with, cradle to grave, um, is most often associated with RICRA. So this cradle to grave mentality includes generation, transportation, storage, and disposal of all things waste. Um, similar to all other things, state authorization, they have, um, most states have primary responsibility for implementing RICRA hazardous programs instead of a EPA. All 50 states and territories have been granted some type of authority, either for an initial program or some specialized program. And again, like AIR, like Mark mentioned, states can set more stringent requirements. So large-scale marijuana cultivators, um, hemp operators, processors, you know, you, throughout the life cycle of your business, you can generate solid waste, hazardous waste, universal waste. Um, you might also be diverting your waste or some liquid industrial byproducts. So with all of this, all different types of waste, all different rules of what you can do. First and foremost, got to figure out what kind of waste you have. How is your state classifying it? What's, you know, green waste that can be composted, green, both in the sense of the plant material itself, but also a lot of states are trying to divert uh, waste from the traditional waste stream and encouraging composting, anaerobic digestion, recycling. Um, so really understanding what's the differences between your waste, what do you have on site for your operation. Then once you understand it, you know, hazardous waste and universal waste, um, a few examples here because there's going to be different storage and disposal requirements. Universal waste, you know, typically what we think of batteries, fluorescent light bulbs, something like that. Hazardous waste, more or less obvious what you're thinking of, solvents, coolants, lubricants, chemicals, you know, exactly what you would think of as a hazard, and then going back to that OSHA, you got to identify those hazards, not only for RICRA, but also for OSHA to keep your workers safe um, and keep you out of trouble. So, you know, regulations under RICLA include determining your generator status. Once you figured out what kind of waste you have, how much are you generating? You need to know that. You need to record keep on that. You need to figure out, um, you know, what classification you fall under. Are you conditionally exempt small quantity generator? for hazardous waste, are you a small quantity or a large quantity generator, different rules will apply to you depending on you know, how much waste you generate. Then there's also gonna be labeling and storage requirements. You can only keep this waste on site for a certain number of days. Um, and then last, transportation and disposal. 
you know, you've got as a generator of this waste an obligation to dispose of it. Um, and, you know, fun fact here, you know, a generator must sign a hazardous waste manifest before it leaves your facility. So you got to put pen to paper, keep that record saying I'm disposing of it and I'm the one signing off on this on behalf of the company and the facility. But Department of Transportation, so Federal Transportation Agency, requires that whoever signing that piece of paper has completed a RICRA training within the last three years. So you might think you're doing the right thing. Oh, sure, I can sign that manifest. No problem. Let's dispose of the waste. But technically, if you yourself as a signatory haven't had that training completed within the past three years, you should not be signing that manifest. Um, and then you can yourself get in trouble. So make sure anyone listening, uh, make sure you know the DOT requirements or who's signing off on that generation and definitely take a look to make sure your record training has been completed in the past three years if your employer or you yourself as the employer has, has been signing those. Um, ran through that super fast, uh, but going to move on to pesticides just to keep this moving along. So FIFRA, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, uh, sorry, I always butcher that last, that last R there, but again, regulated by EPA. Um, you know, a little interesting fact here, when we think of pesticides, we typically think of plant spraying it on, you know, our crops here, but EPA also regulates pesticides for food and feed uses. So, you know, that's under the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, so that other federal agency sets the limits about how much pesticides permitted on anything you're consuming, um, which is good as a consumer uh, to know what's going on, and what those thresholds are in your food. States also then have authority to uh, set stricter limits there. So just in terms of what's allowed for pesticides, uh, currently, before EPA decides to register a pesticide, the applicant has to show that the pesticide will not cause unreasonably adverse effects to the environment. So here, not only are they worried about protections to human, but also degradation of the environment. So a lot of these, once they're in, in the world, it's hard to put um, them back in the, you know, literal bottle that they came out of. So, you know, for FIFRA, it's a violation to use pesticides in any manner for which it's not been registered or approved. And to date, EPA has not approved the registration of any pesticide products for use on marijuana. And I'll say that again, in case anyone was not aware of that, EPA has not approved the registration of any pesticide on products for marijuana. Good news, if you're in the hemp side of the world, um, if your plant's below 0.3% THC, since December 2019, EPA has approved 59 pesticides for use on the hemp plant. So as we said at the beginning, you know, one plant. So if and when federal legalization happens, um, I'll just go ahead and say when. Uh, EPA will have some great precedent to show, hey, look, this pesticide's been you know, approved, 59 of them for use on the hemp. So whenever federal legalization um, does happen, there should be an opportunity to flip the switch and get those 59 pesticides then approved for use on marijuana plants. And new pesticides are being approved continually. A um, couple of few notable extra things here with FIFRA before I hand it back to my colleagues. Facilities that handle pesticides have to adopt workplace practices designed to eliminate or reduce exposure that goes back cross-referencing OSHA once again. Uh, most things lead back to worker safety and protection. So the idea here is, um, you know, establishing procedures in place to respond to any exposure related emergencies. If for some reason your vat of pesticide spills all over an employee, you wanna make sure they're protected. You wanna have a hazard plan. Um, you know, if the fire department gets called, you need to know not only for pesticides, but what chemicals you have on site for any sort of fire pre prevention and protection purposes. Um, you know, with this and most other environmental statutes, there are criminal penalties associated with using a product um, not in its intended use or a pesticide product that's not been approved for the plant, in this case, marijuana, where you're looking to apply it. And then something else to be aware of, states have all various definitions uh, of what is a pesticide, what those tolerances are. Massachusetts, for example, their you know, definition of pesticide is anything with a pesticidal intent. So, you know, something like dry ice is not in and of itself traditionally thought about as a pesticide, but if you're using that uh, to treat plants in order to eliminate pests, they would consider that a pesticide, which is a pretty wide definition. Um, and that's just one example, one state. And then last thing to wrap up this section, um, you do have an option 
under FIFRA to use minimum risk pesticides. Those are exempt from FIFRA requirements. So you might be familiar with this. It's section 25B. And in the industry, it's referred to as 25B or 25B minimum risk pesticides. And this, what this allows is EPA's administrator, the authority to look at something, look at the active ingredients, look at the non-active ingredients and say, you know what, this is safe. You're allowed to use this without a formal review and approval process. Um, you know, they aren't necessarily the most exciting options for you in the marijuana side of the world. Um, examples are peppermint oil or cinnamon or garlic, a sodium chloride, but it does give you some option rather than, you know, hoping and dreaming, no pests will attack your beautiful marijuana plants, uh, that you do have some options here, but not obviously most operators as great as allowing some pesticides. Um, so I know that was a lot, but we're here to answer any other questions. Just put your questions in the chat and we can follow up later or shoot any of us an email. Um, and I'm going to catch my breath and turn it on over um, to my colleague. Hi, um, Heather. Uh, thanks for coming through me. I'm going to talk about remediation and brownfield cleanup. Uh, thankfully, Michelle already talked about RECRA, so you already know all about that. But we're going to talk about a little bit about CERCLA and Community Reinvestment Act and the Small Business Liabilities and Brownfields Revitalization Act in a very brief time, which we will go deeper in a much later time. So this image in front of you, uh, you could see clearly here, this was the former currently contaminated site. And here, and this is, by the way, a site in New York right now. Um, and this is a contaminated site, formerly contaminated, that is going to, that's being proposed to be developed into a cultivation and process, manufacturing processing site. So a lot of people are scared about developing on brownfield sites, or they might not even know they're in brownfield sites, or any sort of contaminated property would be Superfund sites as well. Um, so we're gonna get into a little bit of like what a Superfund site is, what a brownfield site is. You, especially when everybody's in a rush for looking for properties, we see that all the time. Um, I don't think many people check to see if it's contaminated. They kind of find out, unfortunately, afterwards. So there's different measures where you can look at to see if it is contaminated, if there's nothing on the record, if there is something on the record, and also what you should know. If for some reason that your property turns out to be contaminated or it could qualify as brownfields a super fun site, there's ways to get about it and also ways to get some sort of funding in order to clean it up. So the first one is the Community Reinvestment Act, and that was in 1977 it was passed, that the intent behind that was to incentivize the redevelopment of these brownfield properties. Brownfield properties are, in essence, they're real properties. They're the expansion, development, of which that these sites were complicated by the presence or potential presence of hazardous substances, pollutant, contamination. And so those, those are those sites that we're talking about, just like the one on the image right there. So this act, the Community Reinvestment Act, gave forced lenders to provide capital in order to, for, for borrowers to be able to borrow money and invest in brownfield properties, these type of properties right here. And then further on, we have the CERCLA, the Superfund, or Superfund, not really, <laughs> um, which was passed in 1980. And these are sites that gave EPA the authority to regulate the cleanup of Superfund sites. So what is different in the Superfund site? These are really uncontrolled, abandoned, uh, abandoned areas, I mean, hazardous waste sites, as well as that have accidental spills on it and other emergency releases. What makes these sites different was that the from a bound brownfield site is that this contamination has escalated and may pose a threat to life. And that's what makes it a super fun site. And CERCLA is the mechanism for EPA to regulate those sites and to develop, help develop and clean up those sites. So the property in, that I'm showing you, the one in New York, was a contaminated property and actually had, I believe, $40 million of EPA liens on the, that EPA liens on the property itself, which the EPA came in, cleaned up the property, and this is what they do is so they put that on there. Uh, the next, the last one is the Small Business Liability and Brownfields Revitalization Act of 20, 2002. This was great. This one really incentivized developers to build and re 
remediate and develop these brownfield sites. It also, more importantly, by, provided exemptions for liability. Because the issue here with any sort of contamination sites is that you don't want to, you don't want to be responsible for the contamination. This act provided um, exceptions for bona fide prospective purchasers, which would release the liability, even if they knew the purchasers knew that of the existence of contamination, but all the contamination took place prior to the purchase. And also for a contiguous uh, landowner defense, if there's a landowner next to the budding the property of a brownfield site, and they can prove that they were not aware of any sort of hazardous waste and did not consent to the release, that can rely on a consent an exemption. Also, just the innocent landowner defense that they happen to the property, the landowner happened to lease their property to a polluter, and it can prove that they were not not aware of any sort of hazardous waste whatsoever. So again, how does this come into it? It's because there are liability issues, but also opportunities when it comes to these hazardous waste, of these former hazardous sites or active hazardous waste sites that people should be aware of. You know, you have uh, the. <clears throat> You have a continuing responsibility, sure, of cleaning up and remediating the site, but also there's a lot of opportunity here to get a very large tract of land and to clean it up uh, to provide for this facility they're proposing. So there's a lot of different things that you can go around. And as well as you see recently, we want to make sure that you're protected when you're looking for site locations. How many times have you seen like a gas station that would be great for uh, a dispensary? Or you've seen a dry cleaning is very um, important, factories, mills, all these sites that you guys are looking for could have contamination issues. And this is what covers that. And that is what we're aiming to help out with with this. And what we're trying to say is that there, if you find out, there's steps to take, you know, what you could do in order to protect yourself from any sort of liability. And also that you can make sure that you can really develop this property to where it's supposed to be, as well as get any sort of possible incentives to develop the property. And on that note, I'm going to go to the, my colleagues for the next one. Oh, I'm sorry, that is me. I didn't realize that was next. All right, going on to the climate change. I'm just like, so look at all these images right now. So this one, I don't have, these are actually recent images. So you have, I'm from New Jersey, if you can see the sign over here. Uh, this is flooding that just currently happened. So the two flooding ones are, that was Hurricane Ida right there, or Tropical Storm Ida. Uh, these are real. This is, this is happening right now. Um, and the forest fires, that is from a, Col a recent Colorado picture, and the droughts is a recent California picture. So I don't have to tell you that climate change is real right now, but I am going to tell you is how does that impact your property and your, your business decisions here? Because there's been a lot of circumstances, especially recently with Hurricane Ida, is that people's facilities got flooded. What do you do then? How do you prevent that? Um, and especially with a uh, the current drought regulations with the water usage in California and other places as as well. Uh, what can you do in order to still to still kind of to still be able to cultivate in a sustainable way? So this is where it comes down to sustainability and resiliency. Here, it, it, a lot of people think of it as sustainability is one thing, but it's really sustainability and resiliency here. Resiliency is what we're thinking about when it comes down to addressing climate change, is we want to make sure that your properties are resilient. And sustainability incorporates all of that into making sure sustainable business practices. So it's not just the property in that respect, although you can do green building and everything like that, but it goes into renewable energy, uh, water, <laughs> locally sourced material, access to transportation, uh, then they had the brownfield. And then together it goes to energy independence, water independence, renewable resources, resource storages, environmental effects, community support, and in lines in that way. This is not only important because I'm sure you guys have seen this in the application itself when it talks about environmental impact statements. You have to say what are you doing and how are you mitigating your environmental impact in surrounding areas. These are the ways you can do it. But more importantly is how can you protect your business? How can you incorporate this stuff so you don't have flooding in your building or you don't have to worry about power outages or a lack of water? These are things that we can consider with this and there's a lot of different ways and solutions for that. 
one of the most important things is to do is just to focus on the energy and water right now. Uh, there's a lot of upfront costs when it comes to sustainability. However, they are being mitigated by a lot of state programs. And for our resources, we can connect you with those programs that provide uh, rebates, incentives to alleviate those upfront costs. But the money that it saves in the end, and also the reassurance that you're not gonna have to worry about a power outage, you're not gonna have to worry about a drought, is undeniable. So it's important to think beyond these sort of, of just your traditional sort of business models. We do have to think more about how to make your business resilient and how to make it sustainable. And it's not just the property itself, but it's also how you handle the entire chain of command here. And so we're gonna explore this on another session because it's, I mean, we could talk all day about this. <laughs> I'm sure they can have more and more sessions on this, but it's a big thing of how we're talking about sustainability. Uh, now more than ever, state regulations are talking about uh, biodegradable packaging. How do you deal with packaging um, as well? Uh, in New Jersey that is, they're trying to incentivize people to do that. A lot of these already are done by state. So how do you mitigate those effects of climate change and make sure, sure that you are both resilient and sustainable? Applying by state regulations, federal regulations, but also protecting your business and being up at the front of that as well. Because the truth is, is a sustainable business is going to be a more successful business in itself. You're going to save a lot more money. And you're not going to have to worry about the previous pictures so much for this. If like with different technology of how you can mitigate these horrific type of issues. And that I'm going to go to my next, uh, I believe that's Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Um one last piece about picking up with what Heather just alluded to, which is as we're finding new states come online with regard to licensing and especially competitive licensing regimes, they often have a sustainability section uh, and an environmental impact section uh, where you can score extra points if you are thinking outside the box with regard to some of these environmental uh, sustainability issues, uh, whether it's packaging or water reuse or on-site power generation or any number of ways um, that you could mitigate your impact on the environment in the communities that you're located in. Uh, so how do you get started here? Uh, before we get into this, there was one thing I forgot to mention with regard to federalism. Most, I, I shouldn't say most, some environmental acts like the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, have something called citizen suit provisions. They allow not just the government, those acts allow not just the government to bring enforcement actions, but actual independent individual citizens that are impacted by your activities. So people in your community. And I know it's hard to believe, but there are some people in your community that do not like cannabis. And uh, there can be opportunities uh, where they could bring uh, perhaps in a nefarious way, perhaps in just a, a community stakeholder way, um, actions under environmental laws to have you shut down uh, or have you directly Im impacting your bottom line. Uh, so you should be aware of, um, it's not just the government that is watching you with regard to your environmental compliance, environmental permitting. Uh, it is. It can also be any number of citizens groups that could FOIA your environmental records from your state um, with regard to whether or not you actually have permits to discharge or whether you're reporting as you're supposed to uh, or whether you are out of compliance with your limits. So something to keep in mind. So what you wanna do is you wanna review your environmental compliance. Uh, first things first, you wanna figure out which environmental laws apply to your facility. Uh, are you discharging to a stream? Are you discharging to a publicly owned treatment works? Are you uh, conducting ethanol uh, extraction where there could be uh, VOCs that need air permitting, uh, RECRA licensing, uh, you need to have SOPs in place. So you wanna figure out where your pain points are, who your stakeholders are, uh, and what your priorities are with regard to the various alphabet soup of environmental laws that could impact your uh, business. If you're already operational, then the day to do that was yesterday. Uh, you want to start to develop an internal team to keep an eye on all of these environmental issues from operations, from your legal department, uh, your compliance department. 
Uh, if you um, farm some of that out because you're a smaller operator, uh, firms like Vicente Cedarberg can certainly help in those areas as well. Compliance. You want to have SOPs to make sure that you remain in compliance with your permits and you want that you're monitoring as you are required to do uh, and that you are reporting as you are required to do. Uh, cannot uh, overstate this enough. Compliance, compliance, compliance. Uh, the penalties, both civil and criminal, are too high uh, to not comply with environmental health and safety laws. Uh, you, again, you want to measure and report as required by your permits. Uh, benchmarking can help you also drive, uh, putting my ESG hat on, it can, it can drive uh, continuous improvement of your facility. Uh, and, and so benchmarking absolutely helps as well. Uh, and then lastly, should you find yourself in violation, should you have a spill, should you uh, find that all of a sudden you're monitoring your discharges and you're out of compliance with your permit, don't just sweep it under the rug because either a citizens group or an environmental regulator could find that. Uh, you want to report those incidents sooner than later uh, because once again, the downsides are incredibly punitive um, and nothing thrills a regulator more than coming in and finding violations and being able to rack up civil penalties. So those are all the different ways you can review your environmental compliance. Um, Michelle and I, I think, are going to tag team this slide with regard to the, e the new EHS practice here at Vicente Cedarburg. It's not just me and it's not just Michelle and it's not just Heather. We actually have a number of people in the firm we have identified that can help with a variety of environmental health and safety issues. Um, first and foremost, environmental compliance, permitting and licensing as is needed for your facility. If you haven't thought about it or if you are getting started, um, that's the first place to start. Uh, as Heather spoke about, there's land use and real estate issues when identifying property, including evaluating a site properly to make sure you're not on the hook for contamination under CERCLA or under some other state program, uh, and also taking a look at potential for remediation agreements and uh, other funding mechanisms to pay for remediation. Uh, and of course, if you find yourself behind the eight ball and you find yourself the subject of a compliance order or a citizen's lawsuit, uh, litigation management, compliance, uh, order, um, action, defense. Um, those are all areas where we can help out. And as Heather said, sustainability and resiliency, that's really um, her wheelhouse. And um, and we can certainly help with, with that as well. Michelle? Sure. And, you know, if it's not us, you know, definitely just encouraging in general, find the resources, you know, we hope we weren't too doom and gloom today, but trying to paint a realistic picture that there is a whole alphabet soup of environmental laws that you as an operator, even though on the marijuana side, it's not federally legal, you are still obligated to comply with these, um, you know, kind of baseline required environmental laws. And this today was just kind of a flavor of some that might be available. You know, we didn't touch on all of them there's plenty more to go you know one thing listed there you know california basically its own country in and of itself really strict environmental laws within that you know proposition 65 so all of their labeling requirements around all of their um you know all of their products that are sold or manufactured in california you know mark uh, with, he's not wearing it right now, but I think he's always wearing his ESG hat. So, you know, the screening and identification, that's all going into that, as well as OSHA. Um, can't drill this enough because it touches all aspects, both side hemp, marijuana, anyone who has an employee, you yourself, even if single operator, you are the employee then, you know, really important to get up to speed on what's required of you, what's necessary to protect, more than happy to help where we can. But, you know, if it's not us, like I said, it's most important you find someone who can assist you if you're not up to speed on all of these requirements to make sure you're well versed well informed and that you're spending your you know very fiscally responsible budget for your business in the right avenue on environmental unlike osha you know there are criminal penalties in the 90s epa more than comfortable stepping in slapping handcuffs on uh ceos you know perp walking them out the front door for environmental violations you know we're not talking about huge criminal acts it's just you know i 
we all are very passionate about the environment, so we feel deeply about this, but you know, most people don't think of environmental laws as something that can end up in handcuffs, not that we ever want to see anyone in the industry go down that path, especially given the whole history in general of, you know, overreach related to cannabis issues and law enforcement. But putting that whole other issue aside, you know, and there is, you know, specific liability for officers and directors, it's not just the company that can be attributed, like I said, to CEOs, unfortunately. So just please, please, please educate yourself. We're here to help. We're going to be pushing out a lot more material, um, which actually, I guess, wait, hold on. There you go. More to come. So <laughs> we've got a lot more coming up. We're very excited. Um, about EHS at VS, um, that's good, good amount of acronyms there, but we will be doing a lot more information. So hopefully you found today helpful. We're gonna be getting into basically everything we talked about today, but without a four minute, five minute stop clock, as you saw, we were all rushing through to hit the highlights, but we're gonna be doing each individual ones um, to drill down into a lot more detail webinars we're going to be putting out a lot of articles and then in general while we are hoping to educate and assist we know that's all well and good but you need the practical information uh, to start executing so we're hoping to share some tips and tricks to stay compliant um, and then you know we didn't even get in today we obviously alluded to some of it and some doom and gloom but this isn't just our theoretical fear that they're coming for the cannabis industry unfortunately there's been some enforcement actions both by federal EPA and state and environmental agencies, typically a Department of Environmental Protection and OSHA, they actually have been targeting cannabis industries, ramping up more so in the past few months, but over the past 18 months, um, you know, fines, deficiencies, notices of violations, uh, you know, their missteps can be to your benefit. So we definitely learned some uh, areas of most priority or, you know, huge areas um, to avoid so you can learn from their lessons and, you know, really here to support you as you go on your cannabis journey. So really appreciate everyone joining us. Um, Mark, Heather, just want to let you all have another opportunity to speak. Thank everyone for joining. And then we might actually get done in time with quite a bit of rushing on our part. <laughs> Oh, and Heather's muted, but we'd otherwise did so well with technology. <laughs> so, oh, wait, Heather, you're muted again. Oh, there you go. Here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to be part of this group, and I hope that we can use all of our knowledge as former regulators to help you guys out. Um, again, you know, while there's this doom and gloom, there's a lot of opportunity to be had for you guys too as well. Uh, in order to to really make the businesses the best uh, and make you guys the most innovative ones as well. So don't think about just all doom and gloom as well, but we're- But think about it a little bit. Think about it a little bit, <laughs> but there's a lot of opportunity to be had here. And there's a, you know, it, it's so important for us to think about these issues coming forward because they really are the future and not even just the future, they're happening right now as those images showed. So we wanna make sure you guys are prepared as much as possible. Thank you. And I just wanna thank everybody as well. Um, it never hurts to be overly proactive in this area of environmental health and safety uh, rather than reactive. Reactive um, is not the way to go here. And, and like Michelle said, we've seen this developing over the last year uh, across the country in various states and with the EPA. And as we drive more towards federal legalization, um, we believe that it is going to only increase on operators as we break down silos between cannabis regulators and environmental regulators in each state. Right now they're pretty siloed, um, but I think the environmental regulators are gonna see this industry as an opportunity for them to start to bring enforcement actions. Um, better to be proactive, we're here to help uh, thanks for your time today, and we look forward to future webinars as we go a lot deeper on some of these subjects. So thank you. So as we said in the chat, webinar recording will be sent to you in a few days. And if you have any specific questions, a few people have been putting them in private chat to us. Uh, appreciate that, and we'll reach out. But here is our contact information. Please feel free to reach out to any of us. If you know we might not be the best one, we'll pass it along to our colleague. As Mark said, there's a lot more of us than you see today. Just we only thought you could uh, stand three little squares today. But a lot more coming. You'll meet a lot more of us in this sphere. And thank you so much. Have a good day. <laughs>